Hello, hello, hello. Hope you can hear me out there. Hope you can see me okay. Uh, welcome back to Sussex Wildlife Trust TV, uh, broadcasting. Uh, I'm back behind the sofa in the front room tonight. So uh, welcome back. This is our 54th or 55th, I lost count, about uh, about 48, uh, a webinar, which we've been doing since um, uh, since November. So we've had all sorts of topics. And tonight we're going back out to sea. Now, uh, as I mentioned on the last webinar, it's, it's uh, National Marine Week. Uh, the, the, the poorly titled National Marine Week, it seems to last for about... Uh, about two weeks. It was National Marine Fortnight, and uh, we had a talk last uh, last week or so about our kelp restoration project. Uh, but this evening, I'm going to welcome my another marine colleague from the Wildlife Trust. I'm going to welcome uh, Nikki Hills. Hopefully, she can turn her camera on. Yeah. Hello, Good Nikki. Oh, are you okay? Now, yes, um, Michael. Now, la at the last uh, at the last uh, webinar, Nikki, I promised uh, Sarah and Ian I'll get my get, get my snorkel out and go snorkeling. So I was so inspired by the cup talk. Now, you could confirm, of course, that this morning I was indeed snorkeling, wasn't I? You were, Michael, yeah. yeah I was there. Very rare sight, a Blenko snorkeling around uh, the coast. But I didn't see very much. It was a bit, a bit murky out there, but I still loved it. Still absolutely loved it. So uh, so I'll be doing it again when the sea gets a bit uh, a bit clearer, less uh, less blowy out there. But uh, it was still fun. Still loved it. And um, I still seem to, I think I swallowed most of the uh, most of the channel. Now, um, for those of you who haven't been to one of our webinars before, I guess the format is... Uh, Nikki and her, her friends will be talking uh, this evening for about 45 minutes. And uh, then there's a little Q&A button on the screen somewhere. You see a little Q&A somewhere. It could be up there, over there somewhere. Uh, you can ask questions there. Um, type your questions in throughout the talk. Try and get them in uh, during the talk if you could. And at the end, I'll reappear and we'll have 10 minutes at the end for questions. I'll write them all down on my, uh, on my little bit of paper here. I'll write them down there. I can ask the questions at the end. So uh, I'm going to vanish now and I'll see you. Uh, after the talk. So I'm going to hand over to Nikki Hills from the Wildlife Trust and Wild Coast Sussex to introduce tonight's webinar. Thanks, Michael. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and as Michael said, happy National Marine Week. Uh, so we've been busy celebrating all things marine um, and sea. So hopefully uh, you'll all be joining us in celebrating that too. Um, so as Michael said, tonight we're going to be talking to you about ghost gear. So firstly, what is it? What's the problem with it? Um, what are we doing about it? And how you at home can get involved um, and help with it as well. Um, so just going to start off um, just introducing myself and the other talkers tonight. So um, I'm Nikki. I'm the Wild Coast Sussex Project Manager um, for Sussex Wildlife Trust. Uh, I've been working with Sussex Wildlife Trust for nearly 10 years now um, and I've done lots of different jobs uh, in my time there um, but with this project I've kind of come back to, to my passion which is the ocean. Um, I think it's fair to say I'm kind of happiest when I'm either sat by the sea uh, paddle boarding on it or sort of swimming or scuba diving in it so um, this is a great project for me to be working on. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our guest speakers for tonight. So. Um, Hopefully they are out there as well. And they're, yes, they're appearing, fantastic, great. Uh, so really, really excited to have you guys along tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, so these are the trustees of Ghost Fishing UK. Um, and I think I need to say um, that they're all volunteers. They do this in their spare time. Um, you know, they've all got jobs as well. So it's amazing dedication from them. Uh, so we've got Christine with us uh, tonight. So Christine's an um, offshore paramedic. She's a cave diving explorer and instructor. Um, and as I say, when, when she's not doing all that, she's volunteering as a trustee, a diver and photographer with Ghost Fishing UK. Um, and quite rightly, last year made it onto uh, BBC Radio 4 Women's Hour Power List. So fantastic to have you along, Christine. Um, and we've got Fred with us as well. Um, he's the operations officer for Ghost Fishing UK, um, organising all of the dives that they're doing. And really glad to have Rich along today as well, who's the chair of Ghost Fishing UK. So thank you guys for coming along. And we're going to hear a little bit more um, from all of those guys in a little while. So I just want to start by um, talking to you a little bit about the Wild Coast Sussex project. Um, and what we're aiming to do with that, and how we came to work with Ghost Fishing UK. Um, so, Wild Coast Sussex um, has an amazing partnership. We're really lucky 
Um, Sussex Wildlife Trust is the lead and we're working with Sussex IFCA, um, Sea Life in Brighton and the Marine Conservation Society as well. And it's all been made possible um, by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and thanks to National Lottery players. So what's the, what's the project about? Um, well, it's about this amazing coastline. Um, this is just one little snapshot of it. This is a picture I took um, in Eastbourne. And, you know, it's got this wonderful beach, amazing rock pools. There's a lagoon, we've got this ledge and all of these um, sort of amazing marine wildlife as well. So I've picked my top three here. So we've got the grey seals um, and I was actually lucky enough to see them when I was swimming um, just off this beach. They're quite often um, just around the corner around Beachy Head. Um, also get the seahorses, haven't been lucky enough to spot one of those yet, um, but also the cuttlefish, loads of those off the Sussex coast, um, and we've seen those off this beach here in Eastbourne as well, and there's actually an adult cuttlefish which has obviously come in on the tide um, and was swimming around just in this little lagoon here at Eastbourne, um, and we've also seen some baby cuttlefish uh, hatching out of their eggs in these rock pools as well. So great spot for seeing all of this wonderful wildlife. And of course, along this coastline, we've got some amazing communities um, and we're hoping in this project to connect with these communities um, and help them to connect to this coastline and the amazing wildlife as well. So within these communities, we're going to be working with the school. So we're going to be getting lots of kids out onto their local beaches, um, getting to know their local beach and explore it. Uh, we're going to be working with youth groups, uh, running different events for them and working with commercial fishermen to get their um, nets recycled and also training lots and lots of volunteers to help us make all of this happen. And the whole project is about celebrating the ocean and all the amazing things that the ocean does for us and all these amazing benefits that we can get from the sea. Um, and also what we can do to give back to the ocean. How can we take action for wildlife? And in this project, it all starts by leaving the beach and sea cleaner than we find it. Um, so earlier this year, Sussex Wildlife Trust put out um, a survey online and we were asking you about your concerns for the marine environment. And 97% of you said that uh, marine litter and pollution is one of your biggest concerns for our marine coast and seas. And so hopefully this project is gonna to start to try and address this. Um, and part of this is removing nets from the sea and cleaning up the sea. And that's how we ended up working with Ghost Fishing UK. So we've just got a little film uh, to show you now. This is just kind of a little introduction um, into what we're going to be talking about tonight. And it shows our sort of partnership with Ghost Fishing UK in action, working together to remove ghost gear from a wreck just off Brighton. So let's have a little look and see if we can watch this. So we're working with Ghost Fishing UK divers as part of our Wild Coast Sussex project and um, they got in touch with us, they've got some reports of some ghost gear that's on this uh, wreck just off of Brighton. So we've come out on the channel diver boat today from Brighton Marina, we've come to this wreck to see if we can find this ghost gear. So ghost gear is lost, abandoned or discarded fishing gear um, and at the moment there is some big trawl net that's caught up on this wreck. So that can entangle um, some marine wildlife and then that might attract other marine wildlife that can get entangled in it. Um, and because it's made of plastic, it breaks down into microplastics as well. So it's really quite harmful um, to the marine environment. My name's Rich Walker and I'm the chairman of Ghost Fishing UK. And we're a charity that finds and surveys and recovers lost fishing gear from the seas around the UK. So there are five divers on the boat today and we split into two teams. One team was basically doing the, the recovery of the lobster pots and some bits of rope and things like that. And they did a great job. They pulled up a couple of quite sizable lobster pots. And the way they do that is to find them and then they attach flotation bags to them um, and inject those bags full of air, which lifts them up to the surface where they're recovered by the boat. Thank <laughs> you. 
the second team, which I was a part of with Fred and Tom, we were tasked to pull out the net that was wrapped up around the bow. And the way we do that is very similar, but it's a bit more complicated. We attach the lifting bags, the buoyancy bags, to the net, which gives it some tension, which gives us an opportunity to cut the strands of net clear of the wreck. And when you cut enough of the strands, it eventually floats to the surface and again is picked up by the boat. We pulled out two fairly decent sized sections of fishing net, but the, there's a huge matted kind of knot of fishing net that's still down there. And we got about three quarters of the way through clearing that out and we ran out of time basically. So there is more work to do here and we'll be back in a couple of weeks to try and get the rest of it out. After the nets came back to the surface, we were contacted by a local fishing boat that was interested in the net that we recovered. They said they could use it and retask it. So we were delighted to have them come over and take some of this net off of our hands for us. And ideally, I think if we can return lost fishing gear to the fishing industry, then I think this is a great solution, a simpler, cleaner solution than any of the recycling options that are out there at the moment. Wow, amazing work there. Um, fantastic. Just shows the, the effort that went in. And I was on that boat and I know just how much effort the divers went to to get to get that net off the wreck. So that was absolutely incredible. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to um, the guys from Ghost Fishing UK to hear a little bit more from them. Thanks, Nikki. Can you hear me OK? Awesome. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, I hope that video gave you a really good overview of, of what we do. Um, essentially, we started out as a, as a group of friends um, that wanted to do a little bit more than just swim around in the sea. We wanted to go and, and actually um, improve the marine environment for the better. And it's, uh, it's grown arms and legs and it's turned into a, a full blown charity um, still run by volunteers. Uh, none of us are paid. So um, we were delighted to be asked by, by Nikki and Sussex Wildlife Trust to, um, to join their project. And we really, our first thought was, what can we give, what can we give to them? What can we do for them? Um, because they do an amazing job too. So, um, let's just see if I can move on to the next slide. Uh, just a minute. Not sure I can move on to the next slide, Nikki. Uh, yeah, I can. There we go. There it is. Got it. I'll leave the cursor right there. Um, so who are we? Um, so Ghost Fishing UK is a registered charity. Uh, like I say, we started out as, as a group of friends, dive buddies, um, and we've grown into 60 or more, just more than 60 strong um, outfit um, in the UK. We only operate in the, in the United Kingdom, and that is quite enough work, to be honest. Um, but we're all volunteer scuba divers. Um, not everybody in the charity is a scuba diver. We do have some people who, who love the marine environment, who just want to offer their, their services, basically. They want to offer their support and their volunteer time to come and help us with all sorts of different things. And what we do is we um, dedicate our free time to removing abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear. So this is fishing gear that um, is no longer working. It's either been lost due to weather or boats running over it. Um, or getting snagged on wrecks and being being broken free. There's all sorts of reasons why, why nets get lost. Um, and it's not just nets, it's pots, lines, ropes, um, anything that can, can continue catching, basically, at the bottom of the sea. So what do we actually do? Well, our main purpose, um, and we're very focused on this specific purpose, is to remove um, potentially lethal entanglement hazards, um, not just to marine life, but also to, to scuba divers from the marine environment. And that's the underwater marine environment. Um, quite a few of us, we do do, we do do beach cleans, we do do litter picks, but we're very much focused on the underwater aspect. That's what we do best. Um, and we train divers properly from scratch 
to remove this, this gear properly. Um, usually as a scuba diver, when you see this kind of net, like you see in this picture, this monofilament net, it's very hard to see. It's, it's almost invisible in the water sometimes. You swim the other way. You see it as a hazard and you avoid it. You know, you say, oh, there's a net over there. There's some, there's some strings, there's some lines, stay away from it. What we're doing um, as, as divers is the complete opposite. We're going headlong into this stuff. Um, in order to, to survey it and remove it. So um, we can't just um, go gung-ho at this. We, we, we guard it properly because it is potentially a very dangerous thing to be doing. So what's the problem? Well, the United Nations report this figure, this figure keeps cropping up. You know, I'm not quite sure how they came to this figure because a lot of this stuff is unseen. It's historical. Um, my, my feeling is it's probably double this amount. But um, anyway, this figure of 640,000 tonnes is estimated to get into our oceans globally every year. Um, I think Rich, our chairman, um, worked out that it was enough to fill the London Underground, what, three times over, I think he said, um, in terms of weight. So it's, it's a phenomenal amount of lost fishing gear globally. Um, they reckon about half of the Great Pacific, Pacific garbage patch is actually fishing gear. Um, it doesn't know when it's lost. And this is the problem. Fishing gear doesn't know when it's lost. It doesn't stop catching. It's designed to catch and kill. And it's very efficient. It does it very well. And it continues to fish and it catches sometimes the smaller animals first and of course the smell of dead animals attracts bigger animals and bigger animals so even though it's quite hard to sell it to the public that a, a spider crab is caught in a net and it died needlessly you know it's, it's very hard to to try and get people to care about that sometimes you know but when you think the smell of that spider crab may attract a bigger animal and ultimately something like a dolphin a porpoise or a seal then all of a sudden people take take an interest so um we give the small fry, <laughs> the small creatures, as much care and attention and, and um, yeah, as much, as much as we can basically, because um, the knock-on effect to the rest of that marine environment, especially locally, is massive. Um, so we, we don't think that one life is worth more than another. It's all marine life at the end of the day, and it doesn't deserve, doesn't deserve to die in lost gear. Um, and it's not just nets and pots. We do recover quite a lot of rope. Um, usually it's ropes that are used to tie krill pots together, crab pots together. Um, there have been a lot of reports of um, large cetaceans, so whales, that kind of thing, getting in real trouble um, when they've picked up and run through these, these big, long kilometres worth of, of, um, of ropes. And ultimately they, they drown. Um, they drown. They can't feed. Um, so it's, it's a massive problem. So here follows just a few images of um, what this ghost gear can do. Um, that seal was rescued. Uh, it was rescued by the Sea Life Trust, um, so the Cornish Seal Sanctuary, um, G.I. Joe. They rescued him, a seal pup, and returned to the sea. And of course, seals like to play with this stuff. They think it's toys. If they're not trying to, to eat the dead fish in these nets, and they're trying to play with them, and they're trying to play with the boys and the ropes, and they, they, they come unstuck. This is one nice big, nice big pollock, I think it is, um, in a 200 metre long gill net that had been lost on a reef called Hand Deeps. Now estimated to have been there about a year, we think maybe slightly longer. Um, really wasteful, you know, um, no one's gonna, gonna benefit from that. We don't know how long it's been there. Um, and that's, that's gonna attract larger and larger animals onto a really, really beautiful reef and straight into that net. Um, and that's a large um, edible crab. Cancer pugurus, um, really, really tangled up in that in that monofilament net. It takes ages to cut these creatures out, um, and and when they're alive, they they don't know you're trying to help them, and um, they can get a little bit a little bit feisty. So how does it work? How do we know where these nets are? Well, what we've done is we've set up um, a reporting system, or two reporting systems actually, one for scuba divers because we're primarily operating under the water, so we want to know where these nets are and where these lost gear is under the water. And any scuba diver who comes across lost gear can report it to us. To distinguish between lost gear and active gear, um, it's quite simple. If it's got a buoy on it, if it can be retrieved by the fisherman, then it's active and we don't touch it. If it's lost, then it's not buoyed. There's no way the fisherman could get that back. Um, so, so that's how we want. We don't want to know about active fishing gear. We want to know about the gear that's, that's been lost. And it doesn't matter how long. You'll, you'll never really know how long. Um, but that's the stuff that we want reported to us. We've also just rolled out um, a fishing community reporting form, and this is critical because when a, fish or, when a fishing vessel loses its gear, um, 
gets into a bit of a sticky situation. Um, you can report it to the authorities, but then this finger sort of get points at, pointed at you and you, you have to go and recover it. And if you can't recover it, you know, there's a risk of, of all sorts of things happening to you. And so what we've done is we've set up a, a dedicated reporting system for any gear that gets lost. And that's usually strings of creels or nets and they can report it to us anonymously. If they want the gear back, um, we'll strike, strike up a conversation with them and we'll see if we can get it back to them because we'd much rather that gear went back into surgical circulation than into, into landfill. Um, so um, we've had a few reports already um, from the fishing community and we really want to build this up. The sooner they report lost gear to us and the sooner we can get that gear out of the sea, the less ghost fishing there will be. There's no doubt about it because that gear continues to fish the second it's left in the sea. So that's really, really important to us that, that the sooner they report it, the better. And we'll make every effort to, to go and retrieve it. Um, so we analyze these reports from divers and fishermen, and then we start making plans to, to go and recover it. Our divers can operate as deep as 50 meters. That's pretty much a, a line in the sand that we've drawn where you get as, enough bang for your buck, basically. Um, going any deeper than that, I think the risks outweigh the benefits at the moment. Um, so, so that's pretty much where we are. Um, you can see on that photograph there, um, Fred will be able to tell you a little bit about this wreck. That's the can do, Fred. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? This is out of um, out of Brighton. Uh, this is uh, a wreck that we visited on our last trip out of Brighton. Um, this is a, a trawl net, so a net that's towed by the fishing vessel. Um, and it, it had managed to um, just get a little bit too close to the wreck. And it snagged it up on the bow. Um, it's pretty much a complete trawl uh, is wrapped around the bow. It's been in there a while. So it's it, with the time and tide and currents, it's heavily entangled in the structure. It's damaging the structure, the, the uh, heritage, uh, the, the historical um, wrecks that we're getting, that we've got. Um, so the, uh, the, the structures are being damaged by uh, the ghost gear. So it's not just the marine environment that's suffering, also our, our historical heritage is suffering as well. Um, we've made a couple of recoveries of sections of this net, but it's so huge, uh, we're going to be doing it in multiple projects. And we've got another one coming up soon where we'll be going out and getting some more. Well, thanks, Fred. So that's just one example of um, of one of the wrecks, just one of the wrecks out in the, the Sussex area. Um, so what happens next? So we know about these, these um, nets. We've, we've had reports. Uh, we analyze them, we have a look at the depth, we have a look at the diving logistics, um, and then we make a plan. So what we do is we get a bunch of our trained divers together. Uh, we'll put it out by email, um, by social media. We've got several um, channels for our, for our diving members. Uh, we'll form, form a team and we'll go out. And we'll go out and dive that location. And we go out to survey. So we don't take lift bags. We don't take any, any tools or anything like that. We purely go out to survey. And this is really important. We get to see the net as it is in situ with the animals if they're trapped um, and we make a really really good survey of the whole thing and what that does is it gives us a wealth of information um, for making a safe recovery and what we found is that this is not a waste of time and it's not a waste of money we get um, a phenomenal amount of data and i'd say pretty much every time it's led to a successful recovery um, to the point where i think if we if we started just going straight for recoveries, I don't think they would be as good. They'd certainly be more stressful. Um, so the survey is, is definitely critical to a successful recovery, a very clean and very safe recovery. Um, we do video, we do sketches, um, photos. We get as much information about that ghost gear as possible. We count the animals that are trapped, that are alive. If there are any animals that are alive that can be released underwater, of course we release them. Um, but quite often that's better, better done on the boat um, for reasons you'll see in a second. That's one of Fred's um, masterpieces, I think. <laughs> I think it's one of Fred's. Um, which one's that, Fred? I can't see the name uh, of it, where is it? This is the Pentrick, uh, another wreck out near the um, uh, the wind farm just off of Brighton. Okay, and that I think is a sketch made, is that after the survey or after a few, after a few trips there? Uh, this was after the first survey. Uh, we broke the, the wreck down into uh, a couple of sections. So each team did their own section, and this is the um, the consolidation of of our team's individual surveys, and we've put it all onto one sheet. So, uh, for example, in the middle of of the image there, number three and number two, 
that's uh, trawl net that was wrapped around uh, the engine of the of the wreck. Um, and we've now cleared them out so we can update this survey to say those nets have been removed and also some of the, the purple um, ghost gear up near the bow, which is on the left of the image that has also been recovered by us on a project so we can update our surveys and then uh, go back in and collect more gear. And eventually, hopefully it will just be a clean picture. Cool. So. Um... Yeah, quite a lot of planning um, and detail goes into this. So um, quite often, if we get a good weather window, we'll try and do a survey day and a recovery day the next day, if that works. Um, it certainly works for boats, you know, if they can book uh, and for accommodation and people's travel and stuff like that. You know, if we can get a, a block of days together, it doesn't always work out that way. But um, we, we try and do a survey day backed up by a, by a recovery day if the weather's favourable. Uh, we'll get a team together. Ideally, the same team that did the survey, but again, it depends on people's work and family and time commitments. No, this is all voluntary. Um, quite a lot of people have to take annual leave and stuff like this. So they're very, very dedicated team. Um, we put a call out and say, right, we've got a survey, we've got a plan, uh, who's coming? And our trained divers um, will turn up and um, get a very in-depth um, briefing um, about the day. So the briefing, I would say, um, for me personally, is probably the most important part of, of any recovery. It's um, all the information the divers need in a way that they can, they can um, absorb while they're on the boat on the day. And the briefing is done in conjunction with the skipper. So the skipper will do the dive boat safety briefing so they know about the logistics of the day, the weather, the tides, all the safety features on the boat, what to do in an emergency, when you should jump in, where you should jump in, and all, and all that sort of thing. And we're very insistent that our skippers work with our, our daily boat manager. Um, it's not us and them. Um, they're not just our taxi for the day. They are part of the team. And we're very, very insistent that they, they work with us. And most skippers that we work with are, are very much on board. They love being involved. They like being asked to be involved. Um, you know, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a novel thing to them, really, uh, rather than people just turning up, drinking their tea, jumping off their boat and going home. Um, so um, this guy's Steve. Steve Johnson um, from Channel Diver, and uh, we use him down in Brighton. Um, great boat, great skipper, really on board with what we do. Um, he even made some little banners with ghost fishing logos on. We didn't ask him to, he just he just made them. <laughs> and some for Sussex Wildlife Trust. He's all over this, he absolutely loves it. Um, so this is this is just a, a very short example of, of what you can expect from the, from the daily boat manager um, at the start of a diving day. Morning everybody, uh, the goals are for today are we're returning to the Pentriarch wreck to carry on with the recovery that uh, we started last month. The teams are going to be Christine, Kerry and James, Paul, Andy and Tom, me, Scotty and Luke and the equipment's going to be... Five. So that's um, pretty much how it goes. We'll do the team selection, tell everybody what roles they are, and then they'll go away into their little teams of three um, and really go through the nitty gritty, do their equipment checks and all that kind of thing, make sure everyone knows what they're doing, they've got all the right equipment and their roles. Um, and like I said, we, we work in harmony with the, with the skipper um, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, and that's really important. We, we, did, um, we did rock up um, in Scapa actually on, on, a, on a boat for a ghost fishing project. We had two boats and um, for some reason, we don't really know how, but one of the boats didn't get the memo that, that we were going to be bringing filthy fishing nets up on board. And he was quite surprised and quite cross about it. Why are you bringing all this stuff up for? We we're like, well, this is what we do. And so I had to go and have a quick word with him in the wheelhouse <laughs> and explain to him why we were there. <laughs> so yeah, communication is, is king, right? Morning, everybody. Um, oops, sorry, uh, the goal move forward. Today. To the next slide. Okay. So um, actually removing this ghost gear is the thing that all our divers get very excited about, but it's also the thing that's most, most dangerous um, and um, almost the most controversial because we need to make sure that, that the gear is lost and we need to make sure that um, it's, it's doing more harm than good in the ocean, which in general it is. Um, so by definition, ghost gear is lost or abandoned fishing gear that continues to fish unmonitored and indefinitely until we take it out. Fishing nets that are lying on a beach that are not fishing, then that's not ghost gear. Okay, that's abandoned fishing net, that is, that's litter, it's not ghost gear. To be ghost fishing, it has to actually be in the water, catching animals or having the potential to catch animals. Okay, um, so we need to make a very clear distinction um, about that because the knock-on effect of that is when it comes to recycling, um, 
you know, end of life fishing gear or, or fishing gear that's been washed up on a beach as a litter tends to be quite clean. This stuff has got marine growth actively growing on it in the waters. It's, it's very dirty, it's very smelly, it's very hard to recycle. So we, we've got to be very clear about making that, that definition. We deal with ghost gear, the stuff that's under the water. Um, anything on land, you know, that's that's another problem entirely. It's not really one that we're well equipped to deal with. Um, that, that needs to be dealt with at government level. Um, but, but this stuff, you know, it's only divers that see it. It's only divers that see it. And as divers, you know, that's what we do. Um, we don't touch live fishing gear. If it's buoyed, we leave it alone. We do not hack open, um, you know, lobster pots or crab pots. You know, we're very much on the side of the fishermen. They need to earn a living. Um, if it's lost, then then fine, you know, um, but you've got to be absolutely sure. And we've, we've swum for, for very long distances and scooted for long distances to make sure we've got right to the end of a string of krills to make sure that there's no boy there. Um, if there's any doubt, we leave it. OK, we're, we're not in the business of going around sabotaging people's livelihoods. That's not what we do. Um, some gear arguably um, can be considered more of a habitat than a threat to wildlife. It depends which scientists you speak to, which marine biologists you speak to. Some are of the opinion that, look, this stuff is plastic. It's going to break down into microplastics. So what if things are hiding in it? You know, marine life will hide in anything you give them. Um, they don't know that it's ghost gear. So um, it depends which scientists you speak to. Some think that, that it should all come out um, and some think that some, some should be left because there are things growing on it. It really does depend. And that's where our survey comes in. That's where we can make an assessment. Is this worth getting out? Is it worth the public's money who are funding us? Is it worth our divers safety? Is it worth it? Um, so we, we do make these assessments um, before we remove this gear. Um, let's go on to the next slide. The team, um, our most valuable asset. Our most valuable asset. We have 60 incredible people. You go out for dinner with any of them, um, you let any of them in your house within reason. Um, you know, they are all amazing people and, and that's so key. You know, we, we don't want idiots, you know, we just, we just want nice people who are good divers who are dedicated to doing this and we've got loads of them and we are so, so lucky. Um, only divers that have completed our three day training course are allowed to come on our missions. Okay, um, we are picky because like I said, it's dangerous. Um, but you know what, it does motivate a lot of divers. If they're not quite there yet with their diving level or their experience, they go away and get it because they're so desperate to join the team. And that, that's really humbling for us, really, really humbling for us. Um, we select divers based on all sorts of criteria. I say for any reason or none, which is a bit cruel, but actually it's based on the diving experience. They're in water comfort, in cold, murky, poor visibility waters, because the, the UK isn't always great. Um, they're volunteer ethos, you know, they need to be here for the environment, not for themselves. Um, a high level of diving skill, um, high level of engagement with the charity. Um, they need to have the right equipment um, and a good team mentality. Um, so, you know, there's lots of things we look for in a, in a ghost fishing team diver. So how do we do it? Um, that's a great picture there um, of a, um, one of our instructors actually putting up um, a bag on a training course. Like I said, we come into very close contact with fishing gear underwater, which is dangerous. Um, so we work in teams of three on recoveries. One does the cut in, one helps with the lift bag, putting the gas in the lift bag, and the other one is overwatch. And that overwatch um, acts as a safety diver. And you might sort of think, wow, well, you know, they don't have much to do. Oh, yes, they do. We've had safety divers picking people out of bits of net that they didn't know that they were, they were just slightly hooked up in. Um, they've got the camera. So they're usually filming or photographing the whole time. They are the eyes. When all that silt and muck comes up with the net, they can see the whole picture. And their job is to actively step in um, if something's going a little bit, a little bit squiffy that shouldn't be. Um, so they're not just a bystander. They do have an active role. Uh, and then what we do is the lift bags are attached to the, the net or the pot. And we use a completely separate gas source to lift these nets. That bottle there, I think it's, uh, I think it's Tony. That bottle there doesn't even have a regulator on it. You cannot breathe off it. Um, all it's got is an inflation whip, which attaches to the, to the lift bag and pushes gas into the lift bag. Um, divers have been killed um, several times, actually, through using their, their own breathing gas to inflate lift bags. And it's, it's just so dangerous. We, we don't do it. Um, we won't allow it. So um, our divers, again, have to upskill to learn how to carry stage bottles if they haven't done before. Um, and all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, you're carrying quite a lot of equipment in poor visibility, working in close proximity to nets. So, um, yeah, the, the, the skill level of the diver needs to sort of go up at this stage. 
And then of course you get the money shot. Um, so once the, the lifting bags or the lifting bag is set, you make the final cut and off it goes. And it goes up to the surface. Now Boyle's law, and if you're not familiar with it, means that as uh, a volume of gas ascends and the pressure decreases, that volume of gas expands, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which means more and more and more gas fills the bag, which means it goes faster and faster and faster. You cannot stop it. If you are attached to that gear, when it's heading to the surface, there is nothing you can do. You're going with it. Um, at best, you'll get injured. You may, may get away with it. You may get injured. At worst, it could kill you. So, so we are extremely picky um, about who is in contact with that, that net and that bag at any one time. That overwatch really comes into their own. And we look and we look and we look again, do a full sweep, make sure nobody is touching it and away it goes. It's a little bit like using a defibrillator, which I'm quite familiar with, you know, everybody's standing clear. Are they really? Before you press that shock button, you know. Um, we've never had an incident or accident and, and we don't want one. Um, but the potential for this to go wrong, um, when it does, it goes wrong in a big way. So, um, you know, but it is an impressive sight. Um, when these bags go up with a net, you know, that really does give our divers a real big kick. Um, this one is um, just a, a pot uh, during a training dive up in Scapa Flow. And I think you'll agree, it's quite a, quite a cool sight. So on that wreck, there was a whole bunch of um, abandoned pots. Um, so they were, they were great for, um, for training our divers that week. But it doesn't stop there. Unfortunately, you don't come back to the boat, have a cup of tea, high five, and off you go. The hard work really starts. Um, on the left, I think this is one down in Brighton, Brad, I think. That's yeah, one. that's some of the net that we got from the Can Do on our last trip. Yeah, so that's a big, big fragment of, of net with two bags on it. And on the right, this was that uh, 200 metre long gill net off Hand Deeps. I can't remember how many bags we used, but you washed them all and dried them, Fred. How many was it? Uh, I think it was nearly all the bags that we had uh, at the time. It was uh, over 10 bags to get that uh, 200 metre long net. Up yeah, in the, uh, I think it was at least, least 10 bags, wasn't it? It was a, it was a lot of bags. Um, can't quite see in that image, but you can see them all snaking around. I mean, that was a 200 metre long net. Um, I think in total, it took us between two and three hours to pull that net on board and, um, and pick all the animals out. Just go back. It's really hard to see. Be able to move that on, please, Nikki, because I can't see. There we go. It's tiny, tiny little arrows. Um, so once the net's on board, we start counting. We start counting the animals that are alive. We're only interested in the ones that are trapped. Um, you do get sort of freeloaders that live on nets that can just crawl out at any point, and that's fine. You know, if, if they want to hang out in nets, that's cool. But um, it's the ones that are hopelessly trapped, the ones that are going to die if they if they if they can't get out, um, that we count. So we count them if they're dead. We count them if they're alive. We try and ID them. We've got a standing joke in Ghost Fishing UK that as long as you can tell the difference between a crab and a wrasse, um, you can join. But some of us, some of us really struggle. Um, so we've got marine biologists on hand, but it's usually the same suspects. It's usually spider crabs. It's usually edible crabs. We get lobsters. Anything with lots of joints and sticky outy things gets hopelessly caught in these. And the more they wriggle, the more they crawl, the worse it gets. Um, 118, I think we recorded in this one net. Um, most of them were still alive, about 90 were still alive, and we returned them back to the sea. It was a boiling hot day. We all had masks on because of COVID. Uh, we were limited to the number of divers we could have. I think we only had six, and it took two hours. And we just drifted, drifted back to shore, picking these out painstakingly one after the other. I don't think anybody got home before midnight um, after that day. It was an epic day, um, but, you know, really, really hard work. So once they've been recorded and we've picked all the net from them, okay, um, we release them back into the ocean. Um, when we first started up as a charity, um, we, we had uh, um, a lady out with us who sort of, you know, we were just literally just picking up the crabs and sort of you know, chucking them back into the sea. And um, somebody pointed out that we probably shouldn't be chucking them. We should be 
lowering them gently off the back of the boat when it wasn't under steam. And I thought, you know, these have hard shells, don't you? You know, they're pretty robust. But I thought, well, actually, the thing's just done the scent to the surface at God knows how many knots. And then it's been traumatised on the boat looking at us and being picked out of the net. I thought the least we could do is actually um, lower it gently off the back of the boat. But nobody told Mary Berry. And I don't know if anybody has seen this, but, um, you know, I think Mary Berry needs a bit of a lesson in how to treat uh, lobster recovered today. lobsters. Right. So it goes from behind the eye socket to the back of the head. This one is undersized here. And has see, to be past that. Yeah, yes, the back of the head has to be up to there. So, so that goes back? It goes back. It's your lucky day. <laughs> no! Why is that? So yeah, we need to, we need to go and uh, educate Mary Berry, I think, in uh, how to return animals. Can you move on to the next one, please, Nikki? It keeps going. There we go, I've got it. There we go, next one. So like I said, it took two hours to remove 118 animals from a 200 metre long um, gillnet out of hand deep. And it's, it's quite therapeutic, I think. Well, it was therapeutic for, for some of us, not for um, Paul Griffin, who, who kept getting um, nipped by, by a particularly feisty lobster. But um, again, these animals don't know you're trying to help them. So um, they will bite. They will pinch you. And at the end of the day, um, we started doing this out of interest, um, but what we found is that a lot of people are really interested in the weight. It seems to be the, the you know, they don't want to know how long it is or what it's used for, what it's made from. They want to know the weight, how much did it weigh? Um, and it's all a bit subjective because when it's full of weed and water and goodness knows what it does change. But um, we've estimated that one of these juicing bags full of, full of net is about 100 kilos. Um, so we do a weigh in uh, at the end of the day and we tot it all up throughout the year so we know um, pretty much how much how much ghost gear we've recovered and it doesn't stop there um, Fred ends up with a week's worth of washing to do that's his washing line after every trip um, somebody draws the short straw and has to go and refill all the cylinders um, usually at a gas station that's nowhere near <laughs> nowhere near the dive boat um, it is hard work and um, most of our divers are pretty exhausted at, at the end of it I think it's fair to say um, so that's pretty much a, a summary of, of what we do and how we do it. Hopefully I've left enough um, enough gaps in there for you to ask us some questions, which you're very welcome to. Um, but Nikki's been out with us um, on the boat several times now, I think, with on behalf of Sussex Wildlife Trust. And um, I think it's fair to say she had a pretty good time, but she's seen, seen firsthand um, what our divers get up to. And, uh, and we're very, very happy for people to come out on the boat with us. It's a shame with COVID that the numbers are sometimes limited. Uh, but we're always happy to, to fill a boat and have people come out and see what we do. Um, so thank you very much, Nikki. I hope I hope that that uh, enlightened people as to what uh, what ghost fishing is. Um, and we're ready for some questions if, uh, if you have any. Brilliant. Thank you, Christine. I mean, wow, that just shows that the amount of work that goes into that is absolutely incredible. And, you know, again, a reminder, these people are volunteers doing this in their spare time. So. I mean, just thank you so, so much for coming to Brighton and getting rid of all that net. You know, that's just the start. And we're going to be doing more in the future. And it's, it's just amazing. So thank you so, so much. Um, and hopefully you're all just sitting at home giving a big round of applause to these amazing people. And when you stop doing that, um, you might be thinking, oh, this sounds great. How can I get involved and how can I help? And Christine mentioned it a little bit, but just to sort of recap on that. So there's those... Um, reporting forms on the website so have a look at those and you can report ghost gear especially you know if you're, if you're um, divers or other sea users that might come across it um, and, and fishermen as well so you can report that ghost gear uh, sign up to our wild coast sussex project um, we've got a newsletter so we can keep you updated with what's going on um, and at the end of the webinar you're going to get lots of links to show you how to do that um, sign up to ghost fishing uk as well um, you know and if you're a diver uh, and you meet if you meet Christine's picky criteria, but you can see why she's picky. I think that's fair enough. Um, then you know, see if you can become a volunteer. I mean, I think it'd be great if we had uh, a sort of a local Sussex team of divers. Um, be fantastic. And just you know, just with everything um, we're doing with this project and, and National Marine Week, help us celebrate this and and share this with people. You know, so celebrate the amazing work that Ghost Fishing UK are doing and uh, share it, tell people about it, tell everyone. If you know a diver, um, get them to, to get in touch and get involved. Um, so yeah, I think we'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can go back to Michael for some questions. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you for that. Thank you, 
Thank you, folks. That was that was really inspiring. It was amazing, amazing work, amazing work. And there's plenty of questions here. There's a lot of questions here. Um, now, there's quite a few people who are very keen to volunteer. So uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll send a list of questions and, uh, and keen volunteers on to you uh, later on. So uh, um, but I'll go through some of these if you've got time now. Um, uh, Alex, Scott and Ian were all uh, really impressed with the fact you were repurposing the nets, giving, those nets back, giving the nets back to fishermen. And they want to hear a bit more about that. It says, uh, Ian said, it sounds like a great option. Uh, do you offer recovered nets to local fishermen? Yes. Yeah. So um, if you want to get them back to the to the fishermen that lost them, they're going to have to tell us that it's theirs, basically. And it's quite hard to do. You, you know, quite often we will come across nets and we have no clue uh, what vessel they've come from. But I think with this new reporting system, uh, we can be way, way more hot off the press with this. You know, we can recover it. Um, much, much sooner after it's, after it's been lost. We can recover it to the vessel that lost it because they'll tell us. Um, and also it'll be in better condition. You know, the longer you leave it in the sea, the more trashed it gets, you know, um, and it's very hard for us to, to give, especially nets when they get wrapped around pillars and things on, on wrecks, it's very hard to give them back in one piece. But one fisherman did say to us, we said, look, you know, I'm really sorry, we had to kind of cut it because we can't get it out. He said, oh no, that's fine. Well, I'll just patchwork it back together. So, um, you know, and creel pots, somewhere between what, 60 and 100 pounds, I think. Um, you know, that's a lot of money to lose, when, especially when you lose a whole string. And we've given whole strings of pots back to, to local fishermen. So we very, very much want the fishermen to work with us because they are part of our solution right now. Um, so so it was a it was a brave thing to do. We've been talking about it for a long time, saying, look, you know, how is this going to work? If, if a conservation organisation approaches a fishery wanting to work with them, we're viewed with suspicion. And I, and I, I totally get that. But I think you just need one to stick the head above the parapet and show that it works and then the rest will follow. And um, we've been in Fishing News. We've got friends in Fishing News, the editor who's been helping us. Um, a lady who works in a fishery down in, in uh, Plymouth who's, who's been supporting us, just making sure that we pitched it right. Um, and it seems, to, it seems to be paying off. Um, you know, we, there are fishermen out there who want to help. They just don't know how. And, and I think this is a perfect solution for them. Okay, th thanks, Christine. Uh, Sam asked, how much gear have you recovered from Sussex? Fred? <laughs> uh, we've done three projects in Sussex, and uh, I think it was, total is about six dumpy bags at the moment, so it's about five, six hundred kilos, um, and we're coming back with plans to get even bigger. The, the vessel that helped us out on the last trip that was featured in, in the video um, they're willing to come back and help recover it from the surface, which means we can take the net from the bottom in, in larger chunks, because normally we've got to consider once it's on the surface, how are we going to get it back to land? And we've normally got to take it onto a diving vessel, which typically doesn't have lifting equipment or much deck space. Whereas a large fishing vessel, you see the, the fishing vessel that came along to help was three times the size of our diving vessel. And they've got the big boom arms and the cranes and winches, and they can haul onto their deck a much larger chunk of net at a time. So we're aiming to recover a much bigger piece at the end of the month. Okay, thanks, Fred. At least we have another question here. Uh, Scott asked, uh, "Do you have? Do you use your own boats?" I think of that one. Um, no. Uh, we don't want our own boats. Anybody who's ever been part of a diving club will know what a pain in the neck boats are. But apart from that, um, no, um, to own our own boat, I mean, you know, ribs and that kind of thing. You know, you need a rib because you need to tow it all over the country and we work countrywide. So you can absolutely guarantee that the next net report will be as far away from where the boat's residing as possible. So logistically, it's not it's not a good use of our money and time. You can't get very many divers on a rib. You can't get much ghost gear on a, on a rib. Um, certainly not as much as as, as we're pulling in. Um, but another major thing is that you know with a, with a hard boat and a hard boat charter, you've got a fully qualified skipper who's fully insured. Um, the boat can go out in most conditions. It's got a lift, which we use not just for the divers but for the ghost gear as well. Um, and we are putting in to the dive industry. We, I think we worked, I, I think I calculated, we've worked with about 24 different hard boat charters all around the UK at least once and um, quite often midweek. So that would be on days when they're not getting any income. Um, it's great promotion for them because they're involved in a, in a conservation project. Um, they can help us by telling their divers about us. Don't forget, guys, before you jump, look for some ghost gear. If you find any, report it back to me. They act as a go-between. 
Um, so I think it's really important for us to, to support the diving industry by chartering dive vessels, because without those boats, there's much less diving going on, there's much less ghost gear reporting going on. Um, so I think it's a no brainer for us. We're very, very happy to, to charter hard boats. It's, um, it's, it's the way we've always done it and I, I can't see us doing it any differently. I think having, having one boat, which realistically is the only thing we could afford being kept in one place, one place. Is, is, is not really um, productive. Thanks, Christine. Uh, uh, Andy is asking, uh, where do Ghost Fishing UK get their funding? Or do you get any funding? Rich, Rich. 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 <laughs> so we're, we're funded from multiple sources, really. We get a lot of donations from the public, which is is always really heartening because it, it kind of lets us know we're doing we're on the right track and we have a lot of public support. So we're really grateful for all the public support we get. And that comes in the form of um, single one off donations or people do kind of five pound a month kind of, kind of thing as well. So that really does keep us ticking over through the year. Every year we do kind of a bigger campaign where we try and raise some extra funds and Last year and this year, we're doing a thing called the the, um, the big, big Christmas, Christmas give, give. Uh, the big um, give big Christmas, Christmas challenge. Sorry, I get it right. And the way that works is we get various companies that we work with to pledge an amount of money, and then we have to match that with public donations in the run up to Christmas. And basically, what it does is everybody's donation effectively gets doubled. So. We run campaigns like that where we focus on you know a particular period of time where we try and get money together as well and we've had support from groups like the sea life trust have supported us in the past and other charities as well so so we get a very we have a very mixed source of funding and um, it, it's basically it's from all different kinds of areas really sometimes we apply for specific funding pots sometimes it's it's all donation we like we like the fact that it's very diverse because we're not dependent on any one source of funding at any time okay thanks richard uh, andy and sarah are asking if we see fishing gear on a beach should we remove it uh, sarah was part of the uh, the big seaweed search on sunday and she managed to recover a big lobster pot so what's your advice for people finding these sort of things on the beach i think if it's on the beach it's not active gear nobody's using that um so um, I think I saw the question in the chat. She said it's in her garden now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an absolute perfect use for, a, for an old bashed up lobster pot. That's perfectly recycled, in my opinion. Um, if it's in very good condition, you could offer it back to the, to the fishermen or any of the fishermen. They may well take it. Pots are very difficult to recycle effectively. If they can't be used as fishing gear again, then they're ornaments, basically. Most common yeah. thing you will find um, sort of washed up on the beach is just going to be little bits of the, the fishing net where they're, they're chopping them up. Um, uh, they're sometimes named as uh, fishermen's kisses, little cross of nets that you get. And if you find little bits like that, we have, um, there's a scheme now with the um, Anglers National Line Recycling Scheme, and they've got some bins, uh, they're popping up all along the Sussex coast, just a little tube. Um, that will be on one of the beach signs and if you pop it in there then it will get recycled um, so we're, we're working in partnership with them as well so that we can get as much recycled as possible. Okay that's Nikki. Uh, uh, Sophie was asking do you have plans to return to Sussex uh, and, and someone, asked, uh, someone else asked when and where are ghost fishing next going to be in Sussex? Yeah, um, end of the month, uh, the 31st and the 1st uh, is our next project in Sussex. Um, and we'll be planning uh, return trips because there's plenty more work to be done in Sussex. Uh, the last question, I think, is for you as well, Fred. It's, uh, people are asking, especially me, was asking where to get one of those T-shirts you had, those, that cool pink T-shirt. I thought that was great. Yeah, um, another way of... Uh, of fund fundraising is we have a web shop um, we've got uh, our own artwork and design um, and uh, all the profits from the web shop go directly back into funding our recoveries so if you pop over to our, our website uh, ghostfishing.co.uk uh, there's a link at the top shop there's all sorts of eco things in there um, and yeah we've got hoodies t-shirts face masks, snuds, caps, 
you name it, we've got it branded and it's in our shop and all the all the funds come back uh, to do more more good work. All right, Nick. So, so, so Nicky, for Christmas this year, you know what I want? Got my present already. Sorted, yeah. Go, go, go for large, I think. Anyway, so Frank, that's great. Now, I think we'll, we'll um, that's all the questions. There's a few more questions. I'll send the questions on to the team. Uh, they, they can respond. Uh, I'll just, um, so thank you to everyone uh, for tonight's webinar. I'll just, uh, as usual, I'll just finish off with a few slides here. If this works, um, here we are. I think that works. There we are. Oh. I was just going to say, Michael, some of the questions. Um, I know we're sort of going to um, show people the links to the Ghost Fishing website. They've got a great um, FAQ page, which has got loads of answers to this. Um, and like I say, if you sign up to Wild Coast Sussex and follow us on social media, you're going to be able to see all the future um, stuff that we're doing with Ghost Fishing UK. And, and hopefully we'll try and answer those, um, those extra questions for you on there as well. Right, thanks, Nicky. Um, so yeah, just uh, an Alex, Alex upcoming webinar. Uh, we'll be starting on the shore, as looking at sh from shore crabs to Chardonnay. A talk by Dr. Sarah McKenzie, a members only talk for the Wildlife Trust, looking at the wildlife and landscape of the South Downs on uh, Tuesday, August seventeenth. And as always, if you've enjoyed this series webinar, please consider making a donation to support the work of the Wildlife Trust. There'll be a, a little button to do that at the end of the uh, at the talk. As, as, as Nikki just mentioned there. Uh, when the webinar ends, if I've been clever, if I've done it properly, there should be a page which has links to more information about Wild Coast Sussex, a link to the Ghost Fishing UK page, including their great T-shirts, uh, and also some links there to some of our previous marine talks that uh, we've had uh, in, in past months, as well as some donation page. If you can't find that, uh, that those links, if you go to the Wildlife Trust main page, look for the, um, uh, look for the rat, the, I always call it a rabbit, it's a hare, it's a hare. Uh, look for the hare with the big ears and click on that, uh, and you go to the webinar extra bit, it should have all those links uh, there for you as well. So a uh, big thank you to everyone tonight, to Nikki, Christine, Fred and Richard. Um, as I say, there's been hundreds of people watching tonight and unfortunately you can't hear the, uh, the great applause, uh, which uh, they're all, all the standing ovation you, know, you be, should be getting. But uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a crab each. There you are, you've got a crab each this evening. So uh, thank you again uh, for your very inspiring talk.